Those that are gathered here in Warden, we do have a bit of a reduced crowd here today, but uh, certainly is wonderful to have everybody that's uh, able to make it and be joined together. I know we've got a few that are dialed in and on the phone lines and, and certainly want to welcome everybody there and anybody that is uh, listening to this down the road at some point in time. So it is a beautiful day outside. It is time to begin services. I will ask that uh, Mr. Eric Lee come forward and give the opening prayer, please. Father in heaven, Father, thank you so much for the knowledge you've given us and the opportunity we have to come together here on your Sabbath day. And thank you, Father, for allowing us to know your plan and please help us to continue to grow in that plan and please father please just place your presence here and please just inspire the speaking and especially inspire our hearing and help us to gain what we need to from your these messages and please father just be with all your people around the world in jesus name amen well brethren if you'll take your hymnals and turn with me we'll begin over on page 108 in the older hymnals, that's page one, number 155 in the newer hymnals, 108 in the old, 155 in the new. We will begin with, give ear to my prayer, O Lord. Good beginning, and for our second hymn, if you'll turn over to page number 50 in the older hymnals, that's page number 76 in the newer, 50 in the old, 76 in the new, God is my rock, my salvation.
our third hymn. If you'll turn over to page number 74 in the older hymnals. That's page number 106 in the newer hymnals. 74 in the older, 106 in the new. Sing praises and rejoice. everyone if you'll all please be seated and we will have the sermon of the day by myself I'll be right back Well, again, I want to extend warm welcome and greetings to anyone that is uh, listening to this down the road, and certainly all those here in Warden and those listening in on the phone lines, uh, a warm welcome to each and every one of you as we uh, are here to enjoy the Sabbath day together and to be uh, praising God with, with our presence before Him and His, His great throne. Well, brethren, uh, as I was pondering about different things, and I, a while back, you know, sometime last year, of course, that was only a couple of days ago, but uh, I was listening to a sermon, and there was there was a part of it that that somebody read, and it, it caused me to to take pause and think about something that I had never really stopped to, to look into before. So turn over with me, if you will, to Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. And this is, this is the passage where it's describing the Day of Atonement and the time when... Uh, 
Aaron was to go into the Holy of Holies, that one time of year where they went into that special place inside of the tabernacle. But he took with him a censer. And I'll just read here, starting in uh, verse 1 of chapter 16, just to set the stage here. And now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at simply any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of the young goat as a sin offering, and the ram, and of the ram as a burnt offering, and you shall put on the holy linen tunic, the linen trousers on his body, and he shall be girded with the linen sash. And with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his body in water and and put them on, and you shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goat as a sin offering, and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the eternal at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the goats, one for the eternal and the other lot for the scapegoat, or the azazel. And Aaron shall bring the goats on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot is for the Azazel shall be presented alive before the Eternal to make atonement upon it and and let it go as the Azazel into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bull as the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the eternal with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil. So we see the things that he's taking in there. He's taking part of the offering. He's taking the blood and he's taking this censer and he's taking the incense. On this incense, which he took, you know, in in a couple other of the... It says he has both hands full, so he's got two, both of his hands full of this incense, and and this incense, you know, we've we've all probably got a connotation in our in our heads of what incense is, but I'd never stopped to take a look at what it really meant to him. I I think it, and when I look at incense, a lot of times I I get uh, the thought of the little sticks that you get, and you see those. Um, in lots of different places, you can go to a lots of hobby stores or whatever and find, you know, the incense that you burn and there's these sticks and you got all kinds of different, uh, paraphernalia that you can set up that catches the ashes and, and it's, it was never something that I'd really put a lot of thought into, but here Aaron is taking up handfuls of incense and carrying it into the, uh, Holy of Holies. So, but I never stop to explore this. And with that, uh, there's, I guess, you know, my connotations of incense were a lot of these sticks, and it, it really wasn't what I had in mind of what he was carrying in there when I started reading this. So, and I've, I've never really been a big fan of that, because the smoke is just more irritating than the smell is pleasant to me. But, uh, you know, the smoke is produced, it it just uh, was never one of my, it was never a pleasant thing for me to, to have. But this passage here caught my ear and I decided, well, I'll take a look into this. So today, the format may be a little bit more in the nature of a Bible study, but I think I just want to share some of the study that I did in looking at this incense. As with many things these days, we can... Um, get on the internet 
and there's a plethora of information out there. Of course, we've got to be careful with everything out there, but I just did a quick search, and nearly always when you search for a topic, one of the first places it pops up these days is Wikipedia, and it's a compilation of things. But they had, a, had an interesting um, definition in there, and it says here that incense is an aromatic biotic material which releases fragrant smoke when burned. The term refers to the material itself rather than the aroma that it produces. Incense is used for a variety of purposes, including the ceremonies of religion, to overcome bad smells, repel insects, and I think, ah, it jumped in my head. I've burned a whole lot of mosquito coils in my time, which are basically incense and they actually talked about it in another part in this uh, in this article here as well. So, spirit, spirituality, aromatherapy, meditation, and for simple pleasure. Incense is composed of aromatic plant materials, often combined with essential oils. The forms taken by incense differ with the underlying culture and have changed with advances in technology, increasing diversity in the reasons for burning it. Incense can generally be separated into two main types, indirect burning and direct burning. Um, the indirect burning incense, or non-combustible, is not capable of burning on its own and requires a separate heat source. Direct burning incense, or like the ones with the sticks, that a lot of times it's a bamboo stick that maintains the heat source in it, is lit directly from a flame and then fanned or blown out, uh, leaving a coal uh, ember on it that smolders and releases fragrance. Direct burning incense is either a paste formed around a bamboo stick or a paste that is extruded onto a stick or cone shape. So that's where I, I guess I began and then um, also going over and just looking at the word, how it's used uh, from a biblical standpoint. The word incense that's translated there in Leviticus 16 is uh, the Strong's word uh, number 7004, so 7004. And, uh, please forgive my pronunciation, but I believe it's Ketoreth. Ketoreth, I believe. I think it's one of the more guttural K's on that, but Ketoreth. Uh, it's the smoke or order, odor of burning, sacrifice, incense. And the definition just means it's smoke and it's used during sacrifices. And it's this word's used 58 times as incense, once as perfume, and once as smoke throughout the Old Testament. So in the, in the Hebrew there. We can find the makeup or the, the components of this incense that was used at the temple over in Exodus 30. So if you turn over there with me, Exodus 30, Exodus 30 begins with describing the altar of incense, and later on over here in verse 34, Exodus 30 and verse 34, says, and the Eternal said to Moses, take sweet spices, stacti, and anyaka, and galbanium, and pure frankincense. With these sweet spices, there shall be equal amounts of each. So, anybody know what stacti is? I didn't either. So, again, looking that up. Look that one up. Uh, it's Strong's 5198. It's used twice. It's used here and over in Job 36 and verse 27. It's Nafta. Naf natif. Sorry, Natif. Natif, which means a drop. It's, it's an extract from, from a plant. And it means a drop because it's a drop of the sap that comes out of it. And in the research that I did, it looks like it is most likely a very pure form of myrrh. 
And that myrrh, which is in an, an Arabian gum, extruded from the bark of the balsam, balsam dendrum myria, or myrrha plant, and the, the, the myrrh is actually from 4753. The stecti, again, is only used twice, so it's not a real common phrase that we read throughout the, the Bible. But again, it's, a, it's an extract, it's a resin, it's a gum, it's that pitch is what I always grew up calling that type of stuff, and the more pine trees, I guess. But um, the second ingredient is this ancha, O-N-Y-C-H-A, O-N-Y-C-H-A, which is the Strong's number 7827. It's the only usage that they, that they list uh, in the Old Testament there. And it comes from the Shekelith, Shekelith which is uh, spelled S-C-H-E-C-H-E-L-E-T-H. And in this one, we get to the, uh, the explanation that they had in the brown, brown drivers and Briggs of this, it was onyx, or unguous, or differous, or occupellum, or a closing flap, or of certain mollusks with pungent odor when burnt. And I read that and I went, something doesn't seem quite right with this. And the Strong's explanation of it kind of said the same things. But if something didn't sit right. And as I was sitting there one day, I was contemplating this, and I, I asked Carlene, you know, has she ever heard about this? And she said, well, that doesn't sound right. Because there's, there's a couple of things here that, that didn't, didn't set well. Number one, it's a sweet aroma that's, that's presented to God through this incense. And if this is a pungent odor, typically not a, a pleasant smell, but more importantly, if it's coming from a mollusk, that's an unclean thing, which doesn't make sense because it's a sacrifice that's going before God. Nothing that went in before God was unclean. So I did a little more research, and actually in the Brown Drivers and Briggs, there is a, a notation in there from K.J. Jacob uh, from 1889 that, that talks about it's, he proposed that it might be amber. Again, amber being a fossilized uh, pitch off of, a, off of a plant. So again, back to, back to looking into the uh, different things, writing the write-ups and digging a little more in, on the internet. Came to find that, indeed it was, um, there were other people that had similar controversies in their minds with it being a mollusk that was a part of this uh, incense that was presented to God. And there was others that, um, including Winford Walker in 1979 and H.J. Abrahams, uh, that talked about it being from a plant, again, a resin, a pitch that a plant gives off, and they find it comes from the rock rose, or Cystus Leb Labaniferus, Sorry, my Latin is weak. <laughs> Maybe I should get Tanya up here to <laughs> help me out with this. But the rock rose, the petals had nail-formed uh, petals. The petals looked like nails, uh, like a fingernail. And that's where part of the name from the acapellum was a, was a nail shape, is partly how they got to the the definition of it coming from the shell, but it was part of the, partly the shape, and that's the rock rose has a similar shape, but it's the the resin given off from that rock rose plant that creates this second ingredient to um, this incense that was presented on the altar. The third of the ingredients was the galbanum which uh, G-A-L-B-A-N-U-M, listed out there in Exodus 30 and verse 34. 
and it's Strong's 2464. Again, this is the only occurrence of, of this. Comes from the uh, Kalbena. Kalbena. Again, it is a kind of gum or a resin. A galbanium is an aromatic gum resin, the product of certain Belafurious Persian plant species in the genus uh, Ferula, chiefly Ferula gumaroso, gum Um So it's a plant that yields plentifully on the slopes of the mountain ranges in northern Iran. Of course, during that time, there was lots of trade routes that ran through there and probably grew in many different places then than it does now um, as, the, as the times have changed around there. But it, uh, it occurs usually in hard or soft, irregular, more or less translucent and shining lumps or occasionally in separate tiers of a light brown, yellowish, or greenish yellow color and has a disagreeable bitter taste, a peculiar, somewhat musky odor, or intense green scent. So, again, maybe not the taste that you'd want, but you know the scent gives off a pleasant uh, scent to everybody. So that's the galbini, galbanum as the third ingredient. The fourth ingredient sounds a, probably a little more f familiar to us, and that's frankincense. That was collected here. It comes from the Strong's 3828. There's 21 different occurrences of the word throughout the, the Old Testament. A couple different ones in the New Testament from the, the Greek word. It comes from the the bona, which gets its name from the color, from the, the whitish color. And it and this frankincense comes from the Boswellia sacra tree. It's probably the most mentioned of the four different ingredients um, that we've that we've called out here. Now, if we do take the myrrh that was talked about, it there's quite a number of other locations in the Old Testament that talks about just straight myrrh, but not the stecti that's called out here being maybe a very pure form of that myrrh. Now, before we run out and find all these articles down at your local aromatherapy shop and go combine them to have this, I will point out there's a little section later on down here, if we go down to verse 37 and verse 38, that gives us a little bit of a warning but it says, but as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves according to its composition. It shall be to you holy for the eternal. Whoever makes any like it, to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. So it was supposed to have a very special purpose for that. Be used only in the temple, to be used only for that very purpose. So... I'd recommend heeding that warning. But um, so going on, how do they harvest all of these things? That's that's another process. Most of these come from a tree or a plant, and some of them do uh, extrude the material kind of on their own. A lot of times, to get the production, though, the plant will be cut. And then it weeps out this sap. And as, as we think about the, the sap, you know, in trees, it's there. And that's how, like our blood carries nutrients around in our body, the sap carries the nutrients around in the tree. And, and it produces, you know, in, in these cases where there's a wound, um, maybe it's an insect, maybe it's something that's rubbed up against it. Uh, the... Some of these trees had big thorns on them, and you know, so any any types of scratches or or wounds to the tree, it will exude this this sap to heal that wound, and it produces enough. Some of it will just in certain seasons it will run out, like we think of the maple trees uh, for producing maple syrup. It you tap into the tree and it pours 
pours out a pretty good quantity of, of this sap. So and once it dries into a clump on the outside of the tree, then they can come along and, and chip those globs off and collect it. Now that would still take quite a bit of, of collecting to get the quantities that they utilized. And today, the frankincense trees are a little bit in danger because of over-harvesting, because they go in and, and cut, the, cut on the bark of the trees, and it produces this sap out, and uh, they, they harvest sometimes two to three times a year on the trees. And, but the, the frankincense tree is a little bit of a different one because it will heal itself in about three years' time. It will completely re bark itself on the outside as opposed to a lot of other trees uh, in this area. Um, so it was a precious commodity and it was so precious that, you know, and we've just come through the season when the world celebrates a lot of things dealing with this frankincense for one, but it was presented as a gift at Christ's birth. It was one of the frankincense and the myrrh were both two of the, the three gifts that were presented to, to kings, to magistrates, because of their preciousness. And so it was, it was a um, sought-after commodity, enough so to present you know, to the king or to the kings, and in, and as we as we know over Matthew two, in verse eleven, it was it was presented uh, to Christ as a baby. Next thing I looked at was once once you had collected the raw materials, how were they prepared? And it tells us again over in Exodus thirty, and verse thirty five. Going on, so after the the four elements were presented here, it says, You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the prefer, uh, excuse me, the perfumer or apothecary, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting. Where I will meet with you, and it shall be most holy to you. So they beat this very fine. And that reminded me a lot of the other preparations for sac sacrifice given as offerings at different times of the fine flour used in preparing the grain offerings. It was beaten extremely fine, a little extra preparation time to it. The other aspect of the preparation was it being salted, as it talked about there. So it was compound, so it was, it was mixed together. And in the reading that I did, there was different ways that they, they did it. Some of them talked about um, beating it, each of them separately, and then combining them after they were all beaten separately. But this salted that it talks about here in verse 35, that can be referenced to either being finely ground, like salt, or it can be mixed with salt, or it can be just a reference to being pure, like salt. An interesting note that I came across in doing this was that every sacrifice that was presented on the on the altars, each of them were presented with salt. And it brings to mind that we are the salt of the earth. But, you know, in preparing that, it was rubbed with salt or mixed with salt as, as a purifying agent to make that a pure compound to present to, um, to God the Father on that altar. Then how was it burned? So how was it presented? And if we turn back here just a little bit over, we've got a couple of different altars here that we look at, and they have a lot of similarities when you read about them. 
Over in Exodus 27 was the, the altar of the burnt offerings. So Exodus 27, verse 1, you shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horn shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. So here we've got the, the main altar for the burnt offerings, which is five cubits on each side. So a square that's five cubits, roughly seven and a half feet. If we, well, that depends if you're using my mother-in-law's cubit or my wife's cubit. I'll let you ask them about that. But uh, a little bit of an inside joke. But you have the seven and a half foot, a little over two meter uh, altar versus if we come over to Exodus 30, in the beginning of Exodus 30, in verse 1, you shall make an altar to burn incense on, you shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length, and a cubit its width. It shall be square, and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay its top, its sides all around, and its horns with pure gold, and you shall make it make for it a molding of gold all around. So here the incense altar looks like just kind of a mini of the bronze altar, except this one is overlaid with gold. A little more precious, a little more um you know, using the gold rather than the bronze. Now, that could have been for longevity purposes and, and such, but may have had something else to do with, with what was being offered and the, the symbology of using the gold versus the bronze and what was in, in the sacrifices that were offered on that particular altar. Um, going down... In verse 7, so again, Exodus 30 and verse 7, Aaron shall burn on it incense every morning when he tends the lamp, and he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamp at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the eternal throughout your generation. You shall not offer strange incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a meal offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. And now Aaron shall make an anoint atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering for atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the eternal. So we see a couple different things here. That number, number one, it was only for burning the incense, and it was burnt on there twice a day, morning and evening. So, from what I can glean from my reading, they, would, they had coals that they would place on top of this golden incense altar, and then sprinkle a portion of the incense of these four mixed ingredients with the salt on top of those coals and it would create a smoke that would generate and this this incense altar was placed right in front of the veil leading to the Holy of Holies. So it was inside of the holy place, inside of the tabernacle. So it was inside of the inside of that, but not it was it was just outside of the Holy of Holies at the at the veil there that was later rent uh, at Christ's death. <clears throat> so again, it was burnt morning and evening, and it was a perpetual thing. So it was done daily. Every day, the high priest went in, trimmed the lamps, burnt the incense, and the evening came, lit the lamp, burned the incense. And then once a year, it was anointed with 
the blood from the sin offering. And those were the only things that were allowed on this particular altar. So what tie do we have to this altar of incense and this incense in our lives today? We've looked at the ingredients of it. We've looked at how, how they worked with it, where it was placed, how it was dealt with. But what tie do we have to us today? Well, looking at that, turn with me over to Psalms. Psalms 141. Here David, having been chased out of Judea, is talking with God. Psalms 141, beginning here in verse 1. Lord, I cry out to you, make haste to me, give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense and lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So we see here that his prayer he requested to go before God as this incense, this sweet-smelling aroma, and it was also tied as a sacrifice, his prayer as a sacrifice. We also see it tied in. If we go over to Luke... Luke 1, we see this ceremony, and, I'll, and this is the beginning when Zacharias is uh, approached by Gabriel. And so I'll begin in verse 5 here of Luke 5, or correction, Luke 1 and verse 5. There was, there was in the day of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, Abijah, sorry, Abijah, his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before, the, before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the eternal blameless. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the eternal. So here we see that it was Zacharias' job to go in and burn this incense, the morning and evening sacrifice, and the whole multitude, going on to verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. So this kind of leads to, to thinking that maybe some of the people were showing up there and praying at that time that the incense was being burnt. And they were, they were there to present their prayers to God as the incense with, that represented their prayers was offered up as well. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of the incense. So here he is burning the incense on the altar, and here's Gabriel. Had to be an interesting moment for, uh, for Zacharias at that point in time. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled. I bet he was. And fear fell upon him. And of course we know going on there, the story that he is told that your wife's going to be pregnant and he doesn't believe it. and He leaves there and he can't talk for the next nine months or so. so um, but we see that the, the tie-in here of the incense being burnt on the altar and the prayers being offered up and the representation and the people there praying at that time and tying it into it. Also, going on, Revelation 5.
Here we're seeing part of the vision of where, the, where the Lamb, Christ, takes the scroll. I'll begin in verse 8 down here. Revelation 5 in verse 8. It says, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp a golden, and golden bowls full of incense. And what was this incense? Which are the prayers of the saints. So this ties us in that this incense represents our prayers. And here the 24 elders have their bowls full of the prayers of the saints. Also, go over a couple more chapters, Revelation 8. Revelation 8. Begin in verse 1. Here and when he opened this seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense. He should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there was noises, thundering, lightning, and earthquakes. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Again, we see the tie between prayer and incense and the offering going to God. So we also know that our you know this this incense was an offering that was given morning and evening and we're also told in Romans 12 Romans 12 and verse 1 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to God which is your reasonable service so we're to be giving of our our entire lives as a living sacrifice, as well as these sacrifices of this incense, our prayers to God. <clears throat> Going forward now with with the thoughts that of this uh, incense and the prayer, I sat and I contemplated on this for a time. Just thinking about some of the things that I'd looked at and was trying to mull it over in my mind, meditate, if you will. Uh, you know, was there was there something else that was that was a part of this? And I'm not saying that this is by any matter means gospel, but it's just some of the things that I put together in my mind. So, you know, don't there there may be holes in this, so. Uh, I'm not saying that it is gospel by any matter of means, but is there something that's relevant to the four ingredients that that were there? We see that there were four equal parts. So if, if you go back and you look at, at the passage there in Exodus 30, Exodus 30, it says that they were to use and there shall be equal amounts of each of the parts. I thought it quite interesting that the altar that they were presented on, burnt on, was also made of four equal sides. So then I got to thinking, well, if it's on this altar, there's four equal parts to it, and the tie-in with prayer, is there something to do with four parts of that? So then I went over to the model prayer. If you will turn with me to Matthew 6. Matthew 
Matthew 6, in verse 9, it begins, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So when I looked at that, I started thinking about it, and there's kind of four different divisions of this prayer. The first one being the reverence and honor given to God. Where we approach God, we approach the creator of this universe, we approach the one who has made it all, who sustains it all, and we give him that reverence. The second is... In thanksgiving. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're thanking him for all that he has done for us. And the third being repentance. Where we're asking to be forgiven for our debts. And the last one, is the request that we make of him, the request, the beseeching that we make of our God. Each of these is an essential part when we pray. And I know, I know I've know, i been, been at fault at this. A lot of times when you start praying, it may turn into a whole lot of, well, give me this, give me that. Can you give me this? Can you help me here? Can you do this? And we may forget about some of these other aspects of giving, giving ample honor to God, giving thanks for our daily bread that we have been given, asking for forgiveness of our sins that we've, that we've committed, and then, then presenting our request before God. I also found... In the, in the definition of, in, in talking, in the, sorry, in the description of one of the elements, in the Greek, the, the myrrh, and it was also in the, in the Hebrew too, but myrrh stands for bitter. It's a bitter, um, it comes out as a bitter taste. And the, the, the Greek, uh, Four, again, the strongest number, 4666, um, is some Simnura, some Smyrna, sorry, Smyrna, S M U R N A. And it was a perfume used in incense and this symbol of romantic desire because it becomes sweet when fired up. And I thought it just fit very well with something like repentance because when we're going to God and presenting our faults before God that can be pretty bitter stuff to chew on when we're presenting that to God but I think when God takes that prayer he rejoices in that sweet repentance that his child is is being repentant in their prayers so I thought it kind of fit well in there Other things I was thinking about were, is there any connection between the fact that these all are the resins, they're all the life-giving uh, fluids of these plants, and how much, how much do we require our blood? You know, and Christ gave his blood for us, blood in the sacrifices, it's a way that it's presented to God. And there's the passage in Luke 22 where it talks about Christ praying very hard, sweating as if blood was dropping. It was, so it was his sweat that was dropping, but, you know, it was dropping as if blood. The other thing is that I was thinking about is how often do we pray? 
And we see the tie-in here of this incense offering being given morning and evening. And do we take the time each day to thank God, to approach God in the morning, first thing? And do we, again, approach him in the evening each day? In this world, it gets ever increasingly harder to take that time, to make that time in our schedules. And we also have the example of Daniel. Over, over in Daniel 6, as we are well aware, nothing new, but Daniel 6 and verse 10, and this is where uh, Daniel was presenting or the, the satraps and the governors were contriving against Daniel. Daniel 6 and verse 10. And now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. So certainly not limiting to two times a day, as Daniel describes here, but maybe something important for us to present each day, morning and evening. Not that there can't be elements in our, in our day that we can maintain continual communication with God. But carving out that special time to present that offering before God. Well, in conclusion, today we've, we have seen today that the incense that was offered is a symbol of our prayers. Thus let our prayers be prepared by mixing the four elements in proper proportion to create the sweet smelling aroma to God, our Father, daily, morning and evening, and perpetually throughout our lives. All right, now we can sing one last hymn for today. So if you'll all take your hymnals, stand with me, and we'll turn over to page 9 in the older hymnals. That's page 29 in the newer hymnals, so page number 9 in the old, number 29 in the new. Following this, I will lead us in the closing prayer. So page number 9 in the old, 29 in the new.
Thank you, everyone, and if you'll bow your heads. Great Father Eternal, we come before you, we give you great praise, we give you thanks. We offer up this prayer to you as this incense, as we ask that you would guide and direct our lives to be drawing closer to you, to be digging into your word, to see what nuggets of information you have for us on our daily basis and help us to come to you with the right mind and the right spirit to present our faults, to present our requests before your great throne, Father, and we, as you have instructed us to do. And Father, there's so many are around that, that need your great comfort, that needs your healing, that needs your presence in their lives, Father. And we're very blessed to be able to meet here in peace and in harmony and the time to be together as a family, as a part of your great family, Father. And we ask now that your dismissal be here, that you would guide and direct our paths through the coming weeks, that you can direct us to be melding ourselves into the example that you would have us to be. Father, we do ask this now and do pray this by the great authority of your great Son, our King, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.